so so much for taking the time to talk with me about your film the eight mountains which is being released here in the states uh, this weekend first of all how are the both of you doing good really good super yeah. happy to be here uh such a nice uh, amazing uh crew who's working on the movie and um yeah and um it, you know we, we have the feeling that um uh, some people are liking it. <laughs> yeah, no, so the, it's, it's the, beautiful. The views have been beautiful. Um, being at Criterion is a real honor. I mean, uh, yeah, we're really excited being here in this epicenter of you know of good taste, great films, and <laughs> classics. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, it was a pleasure just getting a chance to meet both of you in person last night. You both spoke so well about the movie, and I'm hoping I can translate some of that here to our listeners. Um, I want to first start off by asking about the adaptation process. Uh, coming across the book, writing the screenplay together. Um, Felix, I know you've collaborated with other writers before, uh, but can you also talk to me um, a little bit about co-directing as well and how each of you split the duties? between who would do what in both the writing and the directing process? Um, so to go back a little, we, we uh, were a couple, we've been together 15 years. Uh, we have worked in different forms together. 15 Charlotte, years. Yeah. Charlotte's an extra actress. <laughs> and, uh, she's an extra, yeah. I'm an extra <laughs> on most of his films. <laughs> she's an actress and uh, she makes theater and music and she's very creative. But we had also written together a version of a film that I made, Book Circle Breakdown. And we had always, uh, since then, been wanting to, to collaborate again together on the writing, because it had been a very um, beautiful and important uh, part of the process. Um, and uh, we're looking for something to do together. And this project came up. Came up. I really loved it. Fell for it. Charlotte joined along the way. She also realized that if she was uh, wanted to do something, this was the one for her. And uh, we started writing uh, right when the pandemic had hit uh, the world. And uh, so it was a very intense process on a, on a, on a lot of different um, uh, levels for us as we were going through a hard time as a couple as well. Uh, but it was also very healing. And I, you know, it, I thought Charlotte did an amazing job on the script. She came up with a lot of great ideas and it really clicked between us. And I realized that the both of us, that, that having four eyes, four ears, uh, man, woman, girlfriend, boyfriend, all those things um, made the story richer because it's a very layered story. And so I wanted to bring her on for the directing. I thought she was ready and that she had, she wanted to do that. And uh, so I asked her and she said, yes. Uh, and she asked me, how do you think we're gonna do that? And I said, I have no idea, but We'll figure it out because we we the writing went great. So it I mean the basis was laid. The basis was there. We shared a great taste. Well, great taste. We shared taste, and it made the film the story better. So we would figure it out along the way, mm -hmm. and we did. And what was clear is that also in the next steps, uh, we always got along in casting. We we shared the same taste, um, and that's how we progressed. And obviously I have more experience. So, you know, Charlotte was maybe a little more reluctant at the beginning, but at the same time, she felt very comfortable with the writing. And so she kept on working on the script and where, where I started more uh, preparing visually the movie, I guess, with Ruben, with mm -hmm. who I had been working for together for a long time, well, uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started out. But during the process, it just blended all more together. And, and Charlotte was part of the movie on every level. And, and um, you know, uh, all the big discussions we, we always agreed on. Um, yes. And if we would ever have um, issues on set, I mean, you don't have time for issues on set. Right. Then we, you know, we just, it would, sometimes it would be, how do you say that, hot beneath the feet, we would say in Dutch, like, oh my God, uh, I want another take uh, because I thought like, maybe we should do this or maybe try another shot. And Felix would be, you know, he's always managing the whole day in his head. And that's something that I have 
I had never done before. I don't really do. I'm just, I get lost in the moment, you know, and I'm like, oh, but maybe da da da. And then he'd be like, we really don't have the time. You really want to do this? Because then, you know, uh, we're going to lose this much time and we have this and this and that to do. So this is the reality of filmmaking, right? Is that you you want to, you know, have your day done, do all your scenes. And sometimes you sacrifice a good shot here or the, you know, you have to sacrifice things because you encounter some problems and, or, you know, um, and he's learned, I think, through your career, uh, when to be um, content. Like sometimes, you know, oh, this is great. Oh, yes. And then you move on with like this heart filled with joy. Like, yeah. But that sometimes you don't have that feeling. You're like, is this good enough? Is it right? Because, I mean, we had great actors, all that. But it, it all has to come together and feel so. Is, is this sitting enough? Uh, and then he would always have the experience, you know, and the vision to say, uh, it'll be good enough. Really, we have it. We have it. Because that, for me, was was new, you know. You can lose yourself easily into details. And then by the end of the day, then you don't have the time to, you know, shoot that uh, last scene. For and instance, then, and then you and then, just seen that you yeah. have a problem. So um, yeah. you know, he would often tell me, like, this is something I learned. You know, when I was younger, I made my first films. You would go crazy or you're you shoot an hour over time, you know, and that were, those were things that we didn't want to do at all because it was already a very physical demanding shoot and we didn't want any of that. So uh, it was a very strict schedule. And um, so I, th these, the reality of that uh, is the, like, the time management is something that I really, um, so wow, that's so uh, crucial. And also when you encounter problems to immediately shift your the idea that you know you've been working towards this moment of shooting for uh, a year and then suddenly something changes and you need to put this like do the scene somewhere completely else for instance and just to be flexible and accept that and it's yeah. not as pretty as it was going to be but it's going to be fine it's, it's going to work you know do these things were really it, i thought that was so challenging it was like, <gasps> like breathe breathe but um working with the actors working on the scenes that was lovely work. That was some I work that I really felt easy. was easy. Yeah, it was it was just like the easy part, <laughs> like <laughs> a very lovely part. Yeah. So focusing on the hard stuff, then um, when you watch this movie, it's stunningly beautiful, shot on location, these gorgeous, gorgeous landscapes. Uh, but at the same time, I'm watching this and I'm saying to myself, "Oh my god, they have to get remote crews up in these areas, lug mm -hmm. all of this equipment." Can you yeah. just talk to me about the logistics of shooting in some of these areas and what challenges you encountered along the way? Sure. Um, so we wanted to do everything as real as possible. And in the movie, we see a house that gets built um, and it's a real house. So it had to be built along the shoot. And, and uh, we see a lot of hikes and peaks and very high peaks. We see... A uh, uh, big scene on a glacier. So, and we did that all for real. Um, no yeah. CGI. Uh, to uh, there is a bit to, to enhance, you know, to enhancement. Make, okay, yeah. We didn't really make our boys jump over a crevasse, <laughs> but the crevasse was there, just mm -hmm. like like ten meters above us. Yeah, sure. We we're yeah. at four thousand three hundred meters, and we were there. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So it's all. It's yeah. It was all. Uh, real and uh, the reality of that is that it's all very it's exhausting to get there either by for real drive or helicopter uh, makes your shooting day not so long mm -hmm. uh, you're very um, you're dependable on you know whatever happens with the weather sometimes you know clouds come up and you have to go down otherwise you you cannot get down anymore and it becomes dangerous so you're yeah we had alpine guides always following us telling us what we could do and what we couldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, so the reality of that was that it was very stressful and that that was dictating a lot. Um, on the other hand, it made us it, this idea to do things as real as possible. We did feel as we were shooting and we shot over a long time because we have the four seasons and we shot in different blocks. It made us, re when it, we started to realize that it was working, it did made us also push the limit and go further and further in that because we felt it was working. It was helping the actors. It was making the whole crew experience what the film is about. And so 
you know, we also started to learn more and more how, you know, make the mountains work visually. And so it's, it, it's, you know, it's, um, it, it grew on us, I guess. And it, it became an incredibly beautiful journey where we, yeah, where the whole crew was, was, was supporting this and was, was, you know, doing the extra mile to make it work. Sure. You know, one of the things that I uh, get when I watch this film, uh, I know it's born out of the pandemic in a lot of ways. And so as we were transitioning out of that time, I'm watching a film like this and I'm really appreciating the outdoors and human connection. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about um, how the two of you were able to capture that feeling uh because that's because that's how it is communicated to us is through feeling you feel it when you watch this film it's not said directly in the text but there is this feeling of connectivity to not just other human beings but also to nature and finding ultimately what you feel is your life's purpose along the way i understand a lot of that probably was talked about in the writing stage but can you just uh, maybe go in a little bit about how the pandemic might have influenced um, some aspects of the uh, of the movie. Um, it certainly intensified uh, the process. Yeah, we dove into this story as the pandemic hit and the lockdown came, and we were actually going to, you know, go right in Bali. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to like escape Belgium in the winter time and we're like eh, it's February let's go to Bali with our son and you know we'll ride uh, there but um actually luckily maybe um we couldn't <laughs> and it made our writing process uh so intense and um it made the urge to and the the, the longing for the outdoors and the urge to like go breathe uh, up yeah. there and uh, also uh, yeah it, it made it just very um, real and we had also relational crisis going on let's say we really fell apart a bit before starting to write it um, like make the adaptation and so being in a room together also was pretty it was heavy at the time there's a lot of tension and then this this story was our escape route also the escape um in our minds and escape from our own story we could reflect upon this story which is a very rich and pure story you know you reflect upon, upon your childhood relationship with your parents uh choosing your path in life uh your friendships uh losing our fathers uh, forgiving him for things uh, you know accepting the nature of life itself so for me it was um, and what we talked about a lot was 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 feeling you know this existential feeling that is heightened when you walk on a mountain ridge uh, or anywhere in 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 real nature you know uh, yeah. this the existential just you know you are a tiny human being made of out of stardust as they say <laughs> being <laughs> one with the universe but you feel very small but still you feel powerful so um being part of that being grateful for for this gift of life so um, we went through a very exist existential process writing and uh, when we were allowed as one of the few people during pandemic times to travel there and you mm -hmm. know go okay to, to those locations because we needed to scout the mountains before winter came because yeah we needed to scout them a year before because if not you know they were covered in snow so we needed to go early and 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 we went there in in several different um seasons so it was a great privilege and we cherished that and it was like an escape from our own lives and yet a way to get back to ourselves and it's great too because like i said as i'm watching the movie i feel like i'm escaping through this story through these characters so i thank you for that um mm -hmm. But then uh, speaking of the characters, I do want to ask in regards to casting, because you have uh, your two lead characters being played by multiple actors at different phases of their life. I, I, I'm really curious to know, do you cast based on appearance, mannerisms, uh, just 
they're the right actor for the right job in terms of just overall talent. Like, how do you go about casting um, different people as the same character? Because you don't want to lose the audience with these transitions of, oh, that doesn't feel like the same person. But we don't get a sense of that here. So how do you instinctually know that when casting? Mm. Really depends on how big the role is and how the movie's working, and because uh, I've done different movies where I've done that, and and it uh, every I think every process is different because of that. Mm-hmm. Here, actually, we had parallel uh, casting process for the kids and the adults, and then the adolescents came later. Well, as we were you know, choosing the other ones, um, and we. We had to figure out what the chemistry was between the two pairs. Uh, and that was more important than the resemblance between the younger and the older version for us. Yeah. Um, we actually really, you know, talked about it and said, like, we, you know, it could be the same, but it doesn't have to. And then we made choices based on what we felt was working per pair. And obviously the adults were the most important. Um, and it influenced a bit the younger, I would say, but but not necessarily. I mean, we had people that were really more resembling. We had other small or young actors that were resembling the adults a lot more, but didn't feel right because mm-hmm. of what we were experiencing and learning through the audition process. Yeah. And then that's what happens along the way becomes perfect (laughs) also because like then we brought everybody together and you do readings and and the adult actors are really smart guys and very good actors so they start to take things from the things from the youngers and start to form a bond with them and and found other ways to to match it and so it you know in the end it it starts to feel very natural that's cool uh, and then before we go, I do have to ask about uh, Daniel Norgren and his musical contributions uh, to this film. Uh, can you just tell me a little bit about like how he came aboard the project and uh, what direction you uh, provided to come up with the soundscape of The Eight Mountains? So you talked to him earlier? Daniel? Did you say? Yeah. No, no, no. I, oh, okay. I, didn't, I, 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 I didn't personally know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. Um, no, he... Um, so, actually, we, we, we had a record of him. Mm-hmm. That was a gift to me for my brother. He was like... Uh, he went on a road trip into nature in Chile once, and he was like, this was the perfect soundtrack. You need to have this. And then Felix started to listen to, to this album, Alibursi by Daniel Norgren, on repeat writing because he always puts music in his ears getting into the zone to write uh, somehow it just made sense for him this atmosphere yeah. and after a while he said maybe it really makes sense you know it really sticks with me like this feeling this voice this the pureness the the simpleness the so, um, yeah I immediately got it I was like yeah that's a great idea I don't know why but yeah so we asked him actually to do the score and he immediately said yes, because I don't know, he just, he, he looked up Felix's work and he loved Paolo's uh, book and well, he was just all in and then he backed out again. Because yeah. he's a very, yeah, he's a very, he's a guy, he's very much to himself. He lives in the woods with his family in Sweden. He only does things the way he wants to do them. He's actually very shy and introverted. Mm-hmm. And he's a craftsman, you know, he builds his own studio, he records everything analog at, at home, um, on cassettes, you know, and on tape. So really, I mean, he often works like this, he goes into the wo- woods, and, 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 you know, it's as if it's uh, like the spiritual thing to receive a melody, even. So you can't, it's a very difficult man to push in a certain direction, or, right. uh, so he got scared. Of, like, it was a big production. Yeah. And we tried to meet other people. We listened to a lot of other composers go a completely different direction, you know, because you didn't want to copy the idea after he said no. But uh, it was very difficult. We just kept on mourning his no. I was like, I can't believe it. We emailed him like, oh, Daniel, please, no, he didn't answer. And and after a while, what often happens is that I have a strong feeling 
but I don't really take that like take action and Felix takes action. <laughs> so <laughs> after a while, I just keep on saying it has to be done, you know, it has to be done. And then suddenly Felix comes up with this, this idea and he says, why don't we ask him to, maybe we can use his existing music. Mm -hmm. uh, and we tried it on the, on the edit material that we had already and it really worked. So it was more songs then. So yeah. that surprised us. We didn't plan that, but you know, the songs worked really well. And, and he was cool with, okay. and he was okay with that. And that he wanted to do. And then it yeah. became a beautiful collaboration. He sent us some stuff that he had on his shelf, you know, like maybe, you know, I have this here, I have that. Maybe he didn't make anything for the film, but he sent us what he had. And he, it was a, a beautiful moment of, you know, puzzling, you know, putting all together. He has very strong opinions, but he also, you know, respected us. And it was, uh, it was really great. See, yeah. I thought there would have been a, at least one original, like, new track or something in yeah. there. Oh, that's really, that's pretty wild. Like you said, a puzzle piece in a way. Yes. Um, and so as we come to the end here, um, I know this has been a long process since the film premiered at Cannes last year uh, mm -hmm. in terms of its, you know, rollout. You brought it to Sundance and now it being released here in the U.S. Has it given the two of you time to figure out what you want to do next or are you waiting for all of this to be behind you before you move on to the next thing? Uh, Charlotte's been busy um, and more busy than I. But I start now only, yeah. actually, yeah. We took our time. I mean, it's it was a huge thing. Also, the finishing the movie went really, really fast because we only knew at the very last moment that we were going to be at Cannes. So it was a bit of a roller coaster sure. on every level. And we still, and we had to, and then it took a while before it came out and we made a big decision in our life. We moved, we bought a new house. And so it's been a, a huge transitional phase in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we took our time to cherish it and to settle into everything in order to be open for uh, the next phase i guess so i haven't i've been playing around with ideas but i have to dive into i have to make a choice what it's going to be another yeah. well yeah. as i told you uh, last night whatever it is you end up doing the two of you it's going to make me cry i have a feeling <laughs> i'm going to be a puddle of tears probably by the end of whatever <laughs> project you two that's possible next. that's possible it is very I... well possible <laughs> <laughs> But good tears, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Who, who doesn't love cinematic tears, you know? <laughs> who, who doesn't love that? But thank you both for the tears, the movies, the work. Really, really appreciate it. And thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt.